Thanks for tuning in. Well, another adventure with the Hardy Boys, a secret warning. I started reading this book in the fall of 2022. So I figured it's time I, uh, you know, continued on, got this wrapped up. I'm about halfway through right now. Got myself a hot cup of coffee and some of these awesome liquors, all sorts. Bought these at the bulk barn. So good. So, chapter 11. The Hardy Boys, a secret warning. The boys sped downstairs in their pajamas to investigate the commotion. As Frank switched on the light, Joe let out a gasp. Look, Devilly. The great Dane lay sprawled across the threshold of the guest room. The brothers ran to the dog. Frank and Joe experienced pangs of fear upon seeing that Devilly was motionless. But closer examination showed the Dane was breathing. Then Joe's eyes fell on Captain Early's curved cane laying on the floor nearby. Someone beat him with that stick. And got away, Frank said, pointing to the open window of the guest room. Both boys dashed toward it and Frank thrust out his head. The stillness was unbroken except for the thrum of crickets. There was no sign of the intruder. As the boys turned back to the unconscious dog and Gertrude arrived on the scene wearing a bathrobe and hairnet. Mercy, what on earth has happened? Frank said someone broke in. Tivoli went for him but got conked. Miss Hardy drew in her breath sharply. The nasty brute. Tivoli. No, the dreadful person who struck him. Poor old fellow. Joe squatted down beside the Great Dane. Wonder what you do for an unconscious dog. Give him smelling salts. Don't be ridiculous, Aggrude said. I'll attend to this brave creature. Joe rose to his feet, to his feet and exchanged amused glances with his brother. And Gertrude's change of attitude toward Tivoli was a pleasant surprise. What I'd like to know, Frank thought, is how the brother got inside without touching off the burglar alarm. It's still on, Joe reported after glancing at the wall switch in the hallway. That must mean the system is dead. The boys rushed to the cellar to inspect the master control panel. When Frank opened the switch box, the answer was immediately evident. A wire had been disconnected. Who did that? Joe exclaimed. Look at that big piece of licorice. Frank and Joe noticed with amusement that their aunt had come. 
had said nothing further about putting the Great Dane back in the cellar. Early the next morning, while Mr. While Miss Hardy was preparing breakfast, the telephone rang. Fenton Harding was calling from Philadelphia. Sam and I didn't get back to the hotel until one this morning, he explained. So I decided to wait till later to phone the fellows back. What's up? Joe hastily reported the midnight's break in the, and the delivery earlier of the mysterious grain. Mr. Hardy was perplexed. I had no idea what's in it. He said, you and Frank had better open up right away, then call me back. Eagerly, the boys went down the basement when they got a claw hammer pry bar to rip open the gate. To their amusement, one of the box, one, of the, one side of the box suddenly dropped like a trap door. Empty. The Hardy stared at each other, speechless, then at the crate. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, Joe asked. There must have been a man hiding in there, Frank exclaimed, indicating the hinge side of the crate, which had an inner hook. After he got out, he wedged the side in place. Then he was all set to rob the house. Sure, agreed Frank, but when he heard you telling Aunt Gertrude the dog could stay down here, he had to decide to scram before Tiffany could detect him. So he ducked out the cellar window. You're right, Joe said, snapping his fingers. listening with my ear close to the phone, broke in. But Dad, why should there be any conflict? If Sue Far is on the level, he wants the Pharaoh's head mystery cleared up as much as you do. Mr. Hardy was silent for a moment. Then he said, Tell you what, suppose you fellas go to New York and talk to Sue Far again. Tell him I'm not at liberty to take his case, you know. Not now. was 
looking for Mr. Mohamed Zufar. Oh yes, I'm his American agent. He occupies office space here on his visits to this country. Bogdan led the boys past a huge green. Buddha figure to an inner corridor pointed to an office doorway. Bring Zufar's name. Frank thanked Bogdan rapped on the door. Come in. Zufar looked up, startled from his desk as the Hardys entered. He listened with obvious impatience as Frank repeated that Mr. Hardy, what Mr. Hardy had said. Then he bowed a fist on the desk. Now listen. Something has come up. That changes everything. Your father must help me. Mohammed 
Sufar speaking. Suddenly the dealer's face grew pale. He beckoned Frank frantically to the hardies and held the telephone away from from the ears so they could listen in. You heard me speak up in a harsh voice to say on the other end of the line. I asked if you were ready to make a deal. So far, I looked pleadingly at the boys. Frank and Joe hesitated. Then, with a glance of the mutual understanding, reached a quick decision. Frank nodded emphatically. Zufar gave a sigh of relief. Very well, he said, and to receive her. What do you wish me to do? Listen carefully. Have the money ready in small bills. Take that key to Philadelphia Airport. Use it to open a public storage locker there and stand by. There was a sudden click to the as the caller hung up. Zufar too put down the phone and turned his eyes to the Hardys. You keep the note and the key, and you will inform your father immediately. We'll get in touch with him, Frank promised, pocketing the envelope. Goodbye. Frank and Joe left the office. In the corridor, they almost bumped into Fritz Bogdan. The proprietor gave them a thin smile and walked on quickly down the hall to the rear storage room. As the boys went through the display area, their gaze swept over the exotic assortment of merchandise. Tiger skin rug hung from one wall. Between dusty carpets and tapestries, near the green boot of the painted face of a Egyptian mummy, stared back at them slightlessly. Both boys felt there was something sinister about the dingy place. An employee was moving a large, murky-colored landscape painting to him. The Hardys recognized him as Zufar's grand face chauffeur. When they reached the street, Joe muttered, Do you propose that fellow Bogdan was eavesdropping? Don't know. I was wondering the same thing. Frank replied, You know, I have a feeling. I've seen him somewhere before. Me too. I thought his face sort of looked familiar. Neither the boys could explain the impression. Well, Frank said, we better get in touch with Dad and get a bite to eat. I could sure use a couple of hamburgers. Setting a drugstore in the next corner, the boys on side where Frank placed phoned their father. Mr. Hardy readily approved of their son's actions. Don't worry, you and Joe use good judgment, he said. The Philadelphia airport angle strikes me as a good omen, too. How so, Dad? There are only a few private collectors in the eastern United States who might be avid enough and rich enough to buy something like the gold pharaoh's head. Even if it was stolen, the detective explained the two most likely purchasers live within 50 miles of Philadelphia. That's why Sam and I have been concentrating on this area. Sure hope this lead pays off, Frank said. What's our next move, Dad? instructed the boys to take the letter with the key to the Guardia Airport and leave it with a friend who worked for one of the airlines. Sam Bradley went on, would fly there, pick up the envelope and bring it back to Philadelphia. Frank asked, does that mean Sam will be coming to Bayport this afternoon? I may need his help on this new development, said Zufar. Mr. Hardy said, anyhow, I made a slight change of plans for you two fellows. Excited Frank Singer showed it close to the receiver. The Crux diving company salvage ship is leaving New York today to begin operations on the Catawba. Captain, Frank has agreed to take you and Joe along and drop you on the whaleboard island. The vessel will be close at hand in case of emergency, the detective added. They could pursue the Jolly Rogers mystery and keep in touch with the salvage companies. That's that's great, Dad, said Frank. But would it be better if we had the sleuth along with us? Because it has a radio. 
a hasty discussion they decided that Joe would board the cruise, the crux ship, alone. Frank returned to Bayport, get Chet and Sleuth, and proceed to Whaleboat Island. After a quick lunch at a coffee shop, the hearty split up. Frank headed for LaGuardia Airport, while Joe, Joe went straight to Pier where the crux ship Petrol lay berthed. The dog was bustling with activity as suppliers were loaded aboard. As supplies were loaded aboard. Joe hurried toward the gangplank to announce himself to deck officer. A heavy oil drum snug from a cargo hook was just being hoisted from the pier. Joe passed underneath as the boom swung inward toward the ship's hold. Hey, watch it. Joe whirled around as a sudden cry of alarm. At that instant, the oil drum plunged straight toward his head. Now we're moving on to chapter 13. It's got a stock up on my licorice here. Salvage 
vessel, he explained, was one of the type specifically designed by the Navy for offshore salvage work and carried equipment for handling any imaginable marine emergency. Its electronic gear included radio, radar, Loran, radio telephone, farthometer, farthometer, and radio direction finder. On its main deck was a salvage workshop for the forge, welding machine, lathe, pipe threading machine, and various other equipment. In the engine room, there was a complete marine machine shop. Our towing engine has a 40,000 pound pull capacity. We can make this little over the bow, sheaves up to 150 tons. Perry went on proudly, we can pump more than a million gallons of water an hour. Furnish electronic power to a disabled vessel, and there are two miles of steel cable in the water storage room. Need a sip of my coffee. Wow, that's some setup, Joe said. Much impressed. The diver chuckled. We're ready a floating construction warehouse. We carry everything from nuts and bolts to a concrete mixer. Not to mention timber for making patches to seal off holes in ship's hulls. Joe was fascinated when Barry showed him the diving locker forward on the main deck. several series of diving suits, scuba gear, submarine telephone equipment, underwater burning torches, and a full stock of spare parts. Does Captain Rankin boss the diving operations, Joe asked. No. When we reach the dive, the salvage scene, Matt Shane, our salvage master, takes over. Under him and a salvage foreman, myself, my tender, a pump engineer, a carpenter, and nine wreckers, the specialized salvage workers, that is. It was nightfall when the petrol reached curving whalebone island and dropped anchor in the cove. Another ship, which Joe recognized immediately as the Simon Salver, was lying to the southward, but the Salver was now in a different position from where it had been when the Hardys first visited the island. What do you suppose they're doing? Joe asked, scanning the silver through field glasses. Good question, son. Mad Shane then gristled. Salvage master chewed thoughtfully on his pipe. There's no wreck in that area. Or we know about it. Salvage men. Salvage men keep pretty close tabs on, my, on such matters. about them being here, if you ask me. Could be they came to throw a monkey wrench into your operations. I wouldn't put anything past Bog. Take it easy, Rolly, said Shane. Joe was startled by the mention of the Simon Salvage Company diver. Do you know Gus Bog, Rolly? He asked. Do I know him? Perry snorted. We were shipmates once on a tin can. The Svensson. Later on, we went through native diving school together. When he finally got out of service, we worked for the same salvage outfit. I actually thought we were buddies till the time I got him trying to split my arrows. The incident had occurred when both men were on the bottom searching for a sealed cash box aboard a sunken hulk. You could have been mistaken, Raleigh Shane cautioned, just because he had a knife in his hand. I tell you, I saw him going for my airline. He's a slimy shark, said that block. Joe put in, if you were on the Spencer with him, you must have served under Captain Phil Early. The diver nodded for a while. Right at the end of the war. The skipper was transferred to another. Command a few months later after I joined the ship. Good old Pearly Early. How do you get that nickname? Joe asked with a grin. From his first initial and then last name. That was part of it. Perry chuckled. Ever been 
Greece. No, why? Over there, you see Greek men fussing with what they call worry beads. They carry these beads and finger them all the time. Captain Ernie did the same thing, only he used pearls. Real ones to us, surprise. Sure, he collected them. He had some beauties that picked up the South Pacific. In fact, when he was transferred, the crew gave him a cane. A cane, Joe Biden. How come? To carry the pearls in. The handle unscrewed, you see. And there was a hollow space inside. It was typically, specifically made and handsomely carved by our old quartermaster. Joe's brain was in a whirl thinking of the burglary or attempts. What's the matter with that? Matt Shane asked, noticing his odd reaction. Funny coincidence, Captain Ernie's in a familiar. Captain Ernie's a, f a family friend of ours, and I've seen that cane. In fact, he left it at her house. Since there was no sign of a campfire on the island or, or any light in the whalebone tower, it was apparent Frank and Chet had not yet arrived. So Joe did not ask me to put ashore. At daybreak the next morning, when he awoke in his bunk, Joe heard the muted throb of the ship's engines and sounds of frenzied activity on the desk, on the deck. He hurried topside to see what was going on. In the water nearby was one of the ship's lifeboats. While the two seamen rode slowly, Roland and Perry peeked over the gunwale into a glass bottom box, which enabled him to see the shallow ocean floor. What's Roly doing? Joe asked Shane, looking for our power anchor. We lost it during the night. Good grief, Joe explained how that happened. Shane grinned rightfully. That's what the old man would like to know. You could see Captain Rangan standing on the wing of the bridge, tight jawed with a fury over the mid house, over the mishap. Well, Perry located the anchor. Donning scuba gear, he went down to reconnect the anchor to its chain. By the time the job was completed, almost half the morning had been spent. Some had took apart the detachable link on the swivel, shot of the chain. Roy explained to Joe after returning to the But who? Who do you think? The diver re retorted with an angry skull. Seaward at the Simon Salver. It would have been done by a frogman, Captain Rankin has already been on the radio to the software, but he, all he got was a horse laugh. Joe mulled over the mystery. Were Gus Brock and Smates responsible for the loss of that anchor? Or had someone else been the saboteur and swam over from the island on the cover of darkness? If the latter was the case, Joe reflected. Red for Roger's ghost. May might have returned to Wilbur. Much as he would have liked to watch. The search for the catwalk in the way. Joe asked me to put ashore. He waved goodbye from the cove as the petrol sailed out around the island toward the scene of the sinking. Then he began to scout cautiously for possible traces of another occupant of whalebone. Shortly before noon, Joe heard the putt putt of a motorboat engine. He dashed to the cove in time to see Frank and Chet just beaching the sleuth. Hi, you guys, Joe shouted at them. Hi, Joe. What cooks Robin Coon so? Chet asked. Not lunch, if that's what you're hoping. Joe replied the grin. How come it took you so long to get here? Frank explained that Chet had been unable to leave early until late Saturday afternoon. I figured he would drop off. He would stop off overnight at Captain Early's, but he wasn't home, so we had to sleep on the couch. Sure, I want to give it back. 
doctrine, but say, what's so special about that? I can't. As Frank and Chet stared at it in surprise, Joe told what he learned about the captain's collection of pearls and the hollow receptacle in the cane. That's what the burglar must have been after all the time. Frank hastily fished the cane out of the sleuth. Sure enough, a metal ring showed where the cane came apart in two pieces. Joe and Chet watched eagerly as he unscrewed the handle, then peered into the hollow. Well, Frank turned the cane barrel upside down and shook it empty. Are gone. Joe gasped. 
so I'm going to spin here all right. He pointed to the charred remnants of a cooking fire. Nearby was a scout of small bird bones and rusty food cans. Boy, this place gives me the willies, Chet muttered. As Frank played his flight toward the upward from the floor, the boy saw a series of whitish marks on the wall of the cave and at least scratched it with a piece of limestone. Daddy marks of Frank. The scratches were in groups of six. Each group crossed at the center of the line. Whoever stayed here must have kept count of the days and nights and weeks that they were here. Wow, Joe said. He must have lived here quite a while. Joe, Frank nodded, yes. But from the looks of things, it must have been a long time ago. Or it could have, could have been the ghost who tried to blow us up. You're right, Joe said. Still, this might explain the spook that drove, that drove the lighthouse keeper. Dang, out of his mind. Could be, Frank agreed. Maybe some fugitive from the law hid out here. Or some hermit, Joe added. Who only wanted to get, get away from it all. Chet shuddered. Imagine being alone at night in that lighthouse with some creep prowling around. around to the port side with a diving crew standing by under the command of Matt Shane. Here the young sleuths met Perry Stender, a husky negro named Sid Carter, who was maintaining the undersea telephone. The return phone lead was plugged into a loudspeaker. Spotted at the boys and jabbed a finger toward the bottom. Rolly has been down there long enough to find Davy Jones himself. It's slow going, Matt commented his eyes. Glued to the bubbles, erupting on the sloping green waves. Suddenly, Perry's voice came through. I think I see her. Wait, yes, it's the cat. Well, all right. Nice going, said Joe. Matt hastily donned a headset. Was she positioned Rolly? There was a moment's hesitation. Waver on her port side, almost bottom up. Looks like quite a mess. The corona really sliced her. Silence again as the diver made his way close to the wreck. Suddenly there was a dark, startled exclamation, and Perry's voice crackled over the speakers. Matt, something got here before us. What do you mean? There's a hole cut in her side. say that's probably all I'm going to read for now and I'll continue on next time
Brothers explain how the golden pharaoh's head had come into possession of the thesis and the ransom note to Sufar. Where was the whole cart rolling? The salvage master called down. Can't you declare him out? But, until I get closer, but it looks like it came from the engine room. The hardy, the hardy's and jet clung tightly to the rail as a gust of wind swept the ship. The sea was getting rougher by the moment they saw the radio man emerge from a shack and hurry across the deck to speak to Captain Ragan. The captain listened and glanced at the threatening sky and then came over and spoke to Matt Chain. That hurricane's fearing our way, Matt. We'll just get the Frenches, I think, but maybe pretty hard to hold our station. Can you secure from diving for now? Sure, Captain. We found the wreck, that's the main thing. Rolly can start fresh in the morning and get the lay of things inside. Orders were called down for the diver to go aboard this, the stage or platform. After the petrol dropped a marker buoy and the slow process of raising Barry to the surface began. Being experienced scuba divers, the hardest note was done gradually to prevent a diver from the suffering attack of the bands caused by nitrogen bubbles forming in the blood when a diver is decompressed too quickly. By the time Perry stepped toward the diving stage, the sky was almost dark. At night, the ship rolled and pitched violently. The sleuth, meanwhile, had been hoisted aboard. At Captain Rankin's invitation, the boys had decided to return to the island on the salvage ship. sat on the diver's stool while his tender unsuited him. Joe introduced Frank and Chet to Perry as soon as the sun was removed. From the lips of this weather, I should have stayed at the bottom, Perry remarked. Bucking every seas, the petrol cloud back to Wilbur Island. Soon after dropping an anchor in the cove, the Simon Soffer, the Simon Soffer, also put in for the shelter. Gale first winds are now heading. We're now bending the trees on shore. And within minutes, solid sheets of rain came lashing down on the two ships. Frank and Joe enjoyed the hearty meal and the crew's mess, but for once Chad seemed to hold back his appetite. He said nothing but his spouse guessed that emotions the waves of the ship were responsible. Say, I wonder if Captain Hurley might be home by now, Joe mused. Maybe Frank said, why? He might be able to contact him by ship to short telephone. I'd like to find out for sure about those pearls. So would I, if we can get along the deck without being blown overboard. Winds died down quite a bit, said Carter. Go ahead, you can make it to the radio shack without any trouble. Check welcome me the chance for fresh air. Cut me the arteries as they scooted toward, hugging the deck housing for shelter. The rain too had abated, and the boys reached the radio compartment without much difficulty. The radio man, Harry Egner, readily agreed to put through their call. In a few moments, Captain Early was on the line. Frank related their theory that about the pearls might have been the object of the burglary attempts, and told how they'd found the cane to be empty. Don't worry, I've carried many pearls in the cane since I retired from service. Captain Hardy said, you fellas, de fellas deserve credit for a smart guess, though. The captain explained that the pearls which he had collected had been made into a necklace. For his late wife and now were owned by one of her relatives. Frank somewhat let down, observed, so the burglar must have thought the cane held the fortune in pearls, just as we did. I suppose that's, that's a possibility, Captain Early agreed. If he had heard about me from some Back. acquaintance in the Navy, one thing has a stymied Frank went on. How did he know the cane was still at our house? If he trailed you there Monday night and saw you leave the, the next day, 
I tell you about the motors to pick me up? Yes. The fellow seemed interested in my cane. He even asked to take a look at it after I got into his car. It was then I first noticed I'd taken the wrong one and mentioned the mix-up. Wow. You mean he drained the gas tank Monday night, Frank explained. He may have caught you on picking you up when you ran out of gas, swiping your cane and pushing you out of the car. Joe was listening in on the conversation broke in. So he knew where to look for the cane at our house. Well, boys, your theory seems to explain all the angles of the case, Captain Hurry said. At any rate, the burglar hasn't come back. I hope he doesn't. Frank ended the call after greeting, after getting a description of the motors in his car. The rain ceased and the skies began to clear as soon as the boys emerged from the radio shack. Roland Perry met them out on the deck. <laughs> Looks as though we're back in luck. Here we mark. Captain says our hurricane's smooth enough to see again. The air smells good, said Chet, who was rapidly regaining his usual healthy appetite. Then go see the cook has any leftovers. Watch it, he may put your work wash it as a Joe joked. Who cares? It'll be worth it, Chet said. Breezily and trotted off toward the galley. Stars are now twinkling. Bertie in the cove lay, silvered with the moonlight. Voices carried across the water from the software anchor nearby. Perry eyed the boat suspiciously. I'd sure you give a lot to know about what those bilge rats are after. The Hardy's recalling. Boxes read to their father, expressed the same interest. Frank then told the diver about the cave on the island. I look him as if somebody lived in it. It may be the answer to your ghost mystery, Joe stated. You want to have a look at it. Perry and Drake quickly agreed to accompany the Hardys ashore. The sleuth was lowered over the side, and a few spurts of the motor brought them quickly to the beach. When they reached the cave, Frank led the way inside. He shot his flashlight beam over the campsite. Traces on the floor. Then up to the tally mark scratch on the wall. Poor guy must have had some pretty rugged diet. Said Perry. Toying the scattered bird bones. I'd say it was probably a shipwreck sailor or a strand of fisherman. In any case, why live in a cave unless a perfectly good lighthouse handy, Joe? Countered. Why, you have a point there. The diver rubbed his jaw thoughtfully. What's this ghost mystery you mentioned? Lighthouse keeper here a few years ago claimed he saw. Suddenly Joe broke off and pointed at the mouth of the cave. A glow of light was visible outside. Perry strode through them. The cave entrance. Joe and Frank, pressing close behind, a dazzling gaze struck their eyes. The boys caught with their own flashlights, revealing two figures in the darkness. One was a lanky bald headed man with a tuffled sandy eyebrows. The other was Gus Bach. Well, well, I should have known. Perry had a coldly sneaky as ever, eh, Bach? The pretty diver's face took on an ugly skull. He shot a glance at Frank and Joe and grunted. The boy saw his arm like face clenched. Stow it, Perry. Maybe you'd like to tell us what you've been doing here. Perry retorted besides eavesdropping, that is. Bach advanced his jaw jutting fiercely. Maybe like a mouthful of knuckles. Nine Bach. With a guttural sound, that bothered man tried to hold back his companion. We do not want trouble. He's asking for a box to off the man's restraining hand. Looks as if we don't have to ask, Perry said. Someone slipped our, our anchor for us last night. Bach let out a hoot of ferocious laughter. But it broke off a probably as Perry added. At least it's a change from cutting air hoses. With a snarl, Bach hurled a punch at the floor. Uh, at his uh, former shipmate. Perry ducked fast enough so the blow grazed off his jaw. 
Just want to smash the box bow. Bro, and the pretty diver went sprawling on the ground. Box face was contorted with a rage as he picked himself up. Okay, Barry, this time you really got them. That works. Hold it. Everybody turned out the barked out order. Captain Ragan materialized out of the darkness, accompanied by his body boss. That'll be enough. Ragan stood of command at the desired effect. Bark froze suddenly. On your way, you two. We'll go for now, Box and Earl, but... I ain't finished with you two yet. He glared at Frank and Joe. You better watch it, too. He turned and slick off with his companion. Barry Watson, they went out of the earshot, then said to Captain Rankin, What's the idea, Skipper? You on shore, boat, shore patrol tonight? You might call it that role I saw Bach and his friend go ashore. After you three did, and figured there might be trouble. Seems I was right. Barry tore to draw the Bach and I ran for him. Showed down her sooner or later. Frank told the men of the, of the hostile divers visit to their house. Rankin looked concerned and dis and suggested maybe you boys had better bunk on the board tonight just to be on the safe side. Almost finished my licorice. He's accepted, eager to learn what Perry would find on the next descent to the Catawa. The next morning, they tried to persuade the diver and Matt Chain to let them come be buried down and help search the hulk. Shane shook his head, not a chance, lads. The engine room's one of the most dangerous places for a diver to go in on a wreck. It's a rectangle. It's a regular tangle of pipes and machinery and the spilled oil makes it twice as hazardous. At least let us watch, Frank pleaded. We've had plenty of experience scuba diving and we'll promise not to go aboard. Shane and Barry finally gave a consent. The artists made a quick trip ashore with a check to reach the scuba gear from the lighthouse. Then in the sleuth, they sped with the mark, the mark buoy where the salvage ship had already taken up position. Judged to buy fastening for Frank and Joe, donned rubber suits, flippers, masks, and breathing apparatus. Roland Perry was already encased in his diving dress on the stool, a red wool cap on his head. You're going into the engine room, Joe asked. I'll have to. The top hamper's all smashed, and that braid and suit. The waist is lying. Remember now, you fellows, take care. All right, sir, Frank Grin saluted. His helmet was screwed on, the glass face plate attached. Now the air supply checked. Then he clumped into the, the diving stage on his lead, lead booted weights and slowed in the water. Meanwhile, Frank and Joe pulled down their mask and stood at the mouthpiece and tested their regulators. Both leaped over the side. The hardies cleaved their waist deeply down toward in the cold depths, trying to keep Perry in sight. The water darkened in a murky gray as he descended. At last, the shattered, the, the shattered hulk of the Catawba came in sight. Both boys felt a chill of awe in their first view of the dead ship. Already coasted, coated with barnacles and scum, it lay a bed of the ocean floor. Stacks and superstructure ran deeply in the mud. The high bow of the Corona had knifed through it cleanly and into the catwalk's bridge and deck housing, and the resultant wreckage had evidently crumbled further in the weight of the foundered vessel. Don't wonder who he has to go in through that hole in her side, Joe thought. The diver waved to them as he stepped off the platform, then nodded slowly toward the hulk, raising his arrows and lifeline. The hardly saw him close his outlet valve slightly to make his two more points so as to float himself upward toward the gaping hole. A startled school of fish came darting out as Barry made his way cautiously inside. Frank and Joe swam closer. Dark swirls of oil were arising from the engine room, churned up by Barry's movements, and they could see a little except for the glow of the portal, portable under sea lamp. Meanwhile, the boys were fluttered, kicking their way around the ship, peering in from all sides. Somewhere in the sunken freighter was a strong room that had contained the gold.
Paul Farrell's Island. The Hardys there, I suppose, getting a little on the Perry finally emerged. He made a thumbs up gesture to turn topside, pausing in intervals to the decompass, or to pausing in intervals to decompress. They made the ascent. As soon as Frank and Joe were hauled aboard, they could see from the excited faces of the diving crew that Perry had telephoned important news from the wreck. The young sleuths waited impatiently until the summit was removed. What's the dope, Rolly? Joe asked eagerly. Whoever cut the hole in the catawba stole her engine room telegraph and tachometer. The only evidence I can prove who's responsible for the collision. Well, that's it. I'll have to continue this on another video. Well, I'm definitely uh, getting there, as you can see. See you next.